Okay, so today we're going to go into chapter 1. Now, there's a lot of sections to chapter 1. In the very beginning, it talks about a lot of the basics of a computer. I'm not going to go into that. I'm not going to read it. I'm going to make you guys read it. I don't really test you on it, but it's good information to know. But just kind of, I'm going to kind of go over the things that are important. Um, so I'm just going to kind of skip through both slides, go over what I think is important. And then like toward the end of chapter 1 or the middle of chapter 1, that's when they actually start talking about Java programming. That's where I, like, I'll let you know, like, okay, like, this is stuff I'm going to test you on, and that way you know, like, to take notes or whatnot. Okay, so the book starts off by going into computer processing, hardware components, network components. Like, those three sections will not be on your test, but it's stuff that's good to know, especially if you want to know more about computers. But I'm not here to test you on your ability to identify or know what different computer parts actually do. Okay, so... Uh, there are some things that I think are important to understand as a programmer, but I'm still not going to test you on it. Okay, so obviously you need to know what an operating system is, like different hardware is. Um, you can read about that, uh, but just uh, as far as uh, operating system go, like operating system is a software, you know, like physical things that you can touch is the actual hardware. So some operating systems are like Android is an operating system for a phone iOS is the operating system for uh, the iPhone. Uh, there's Windows and Mac OS, which are operating systems for computers. There's Linux as well. Like you need to know, like just, you need to know them not for this class, but just to have a, like a basic understanding of what a computer actually is and does. Okay, so some important things to kind of know is actually this right here, uh, the CPU and the main memory. So every computer has what they call a central processing unit. And that's what actually processes commands that comes into it and stores data inside of memory. So as it's executing something or running a program, it's processing the commands coming in, putting stuff into memory. And then as you know, you're running this program, it's reading and writing to memory and executing whatever commands are coming in. Uh, if you actually like, break out a computer and look at all the hardware components, like on a motherboard and all that, um, everything is really just electrical signals, right? So a bus, I don't know if you guys heard that term thrown around, but a bus is essentially uh, multiple lines of electrical signals going to one component. Right now we use 64 bits, meaning there's 64 lines going to our CPU, right? And each one of those lines either has electricity or doesn't have electricity. So uh, 2 to the 64 power is how much data we can actually send in one cycle of, uh, of, of a clock. Right, um, but all that is computer architecture, hardware stuff, but essentially we can send this information to the CPU, it gets one instruction, executes that instruction, decides what it's going to do with the data, another instruction comes in, and that's how the computer actually works. It's just receiving all this information electronically through charged and uncharged electrical lines. All right, so just I wanted to go over that. So knowing binary is, uh, like binary permutations, is actually something that's kind of important. So uh, here they have this table here. So they're basically saying one bit, okay, the way I like to think about a bit is a electrical line on that bus, right? If all you had was an electrical line to communicate from you to another person, right? You couldn't hear them, you couldn't see them, it was just that one line and the light either came on or it came off, right? So there's only two signals that you can send with one electrical line, and that is a zero or a one or, you know, uh, charged or uncharged. Now, if you had two electrical lines, then you can send four signals where both the lines are have no charge or one of the lines has one charge, where the other line has a charge but the other one doesn't, or they both have a charge, right? Makes sense. Now we have two electrical lines to communicate can't see each other, you can't hear each other, but we have those two electrical lines. So we could send four signals to each other. If we have three bits, we can send eight signals to each other, right? And either all three lines are charged, one is charged, all the other ones are not, two are charged, all the other ones are not, all three are charged, right? And those different permutations of which one's charged, which one isn't, they, it all adds up to two to the third power, which is essentially eight, okay? So depending on the number of electrical lines we have or the number of bits, right? We just take that two to whatever power and that's how many permutations we can have with those bits. All right, does that make sense? 
I don't know if you guys hear the term bits thrown around, but essentially that's what it is. That's the way a computer talks, electrical signals. That's how um, information travels. All right, and here they kind of give you the, you know, mathematical representation of that. All right, hardware components, that's something you can read on your own. And here it talks about all the different parts of a central processing unit. It's very interesting. Uh, if you're majoring in computer science, you're gonna have to take a computer architecture class and uh, you'll go into more detail about all this. All right, networks. All right, so the first part of chapter one, a lot of good information. I think everybody should know a little bit about everything of a computer, but it's all stuff that I will not test you on. I'm only going to focus on Java. All right, so that is it for the first part of the book. The second part of the book, everything from here on out is gonna be testable. So um, we're gonna just kind of go over this and then next class we'll be ready for chapter two. Maybe by the end of this lecture, we'll be ready for chapter two. We'll see. All right, so Java. So the programming, so Java programming language was created by Sun Microsystems. It was introduced in 1995. It is, its popularity has grown quickly uh, since. Uh, it's currently owned by Oracle. It's, for some reason, that's not on the slides, but they bought it not too long ago, and they've actually opened up lawsuits against uh, other companies that are using it, like Google. So uh, I know Google was actually trying to uh, get its developers to start using Kotlin instead of Java. But um, yeah, they've been sued. <coughs> Excuse me. All right, so a programming language specifies the words and symbols that we can use to write a program. A programming language employs a set of rules that dictate how the words and symbols can be put together to form valid programming statements. The Java programming structure. In, in the Java programming language, a program is made up of one or more classes, a class contains one or more methods, and a method contains a uh, program statement. Okay, so let me just bust out that example that we did the last time we were here. Let's see, notepad plus plus. All right, so this Java is organized, let's see, like in a particular way, okay? So every file is gonna have a class, okay? So here is your class right here. This is the class header, what's highlighted. And then inside of your class, you're gonna have data variables or methods, okay? And here is a method. And then inside that method is where you're gonna put your programming statements. Okay, so there, what's highlighted now is a programming statement. This header right here is the method header. The method is opened and closed by these curly braces. The curly braces opens it, this one closes it, and this method exists inside of this class, okay? Open curly brace, close curly brace, and the name of this class has to match this name of this file. Exactly. Case sensitive, right? Capital M, capital F, capital J, capital P. That's the way Java is, their, uh, their programming language is put together. These terms will be explored in more detail throughout the course. A Java application always contains a method called main. See Lincoln.java. Go so here is an example from the book. They have a class called Lincoln. They have the main method, and then they have two programming statements, a quote by Abraham Lincoln, whatever you are, be a good one. <coughs> and here they're giving you what the output is when they run this program. Okay, they're very, these, these two programs, the program they did here, this Lincoln one, and the one that we did on the first day class, very similar, right? The only difference is the name of the file, the name of the class, and then what statements are actually inside of this main method. Every Java programming has to have this main method. It's the entry point for the for Java. That's the first method they get to run. That's where your program actually starts. Okay, here they're defining the different components of a Java programming structure. So the first, they're pointing out what the class is. So here is the class header, and here is the body, right? It's, you have your open curly brace and your closed curly brace. Anything inside of those is inside of the body of the class. Then you have your method. Here's the method header, open curly brace, close, and then you have your method body. 
comments. Okay, so we we uh, we are going to use comments uh, whenever we put any information into our files. As you can see, I did use them the last time, right? This the information that you comment out is not actually read by the compiler. There's three comments that we have in Java. Okay, we have the single line comment, which is slashes, multi line slash star, and then we have the Java dot comment slash star star. Now we won't really use this until chapter four. We'll talk more about that later, but we will use the single line and the multi line comments. Identifiers. Okay, so in Java we have identifiers. Identifiers are words and program that we make up. So what that actually means is an identifier would be like the name of this class, the name of this method. Even though we didn't make that method name, somebody else made that method name. All right, the name of this class, string, and the name of this variable, args. Once again, somebody made that one up. This is actually something that we can change as long as it's a valid Java identifier. Java will compile and run without any problems. Um, but the main is an identifier that was created by somebody who works or created the Java programming language. These things that are in blue are what we call reserved words. Those are words that we cannot use as identifiers because Java is using them for something. They have some meaning in Java, so we can't use them as identifiers. So for, for now, the identifiers that we, we've seen is public, class, static, and void. All right? Those are uh, identifiers that we'll not be able to use. So a Java identifier can be made up of letters, digits, and the underscore and the dollar sign. Identifiers cannot begin with a digit. Java is case sensitive. So total, total, and total are all different identifiers, right? So total with the capital T, total all lowercase, and then total in all caps are all different identifiers in Java. By convention, programmer, programmers use different case styles for different types of identifiers, such as title case for class names. So whenever you're making a class, you give it a, a uppercase letter. Whenever you're making a constant, you give it all, all caps. All right? That's just what we call a convention, like what's practice. If you actually go to our, um, right, where is it? Oh, in the discussion. If you go to Canvas, go to our site, go to discussion, I do have a coding standard that I expect you guys to follow. You need to read this and understand what I'm expecting from you. One of the things I tell you is class names and files names should begin with a capital letter and if they are composed of two words, they need to be what we call camel case where the first letter in the word is capitalized, right? So here is a name of a class, diamond output. Here's the name of another class, tree, <coughs> excuse me. Here's a name for another class, Christmas tree. Now class names that are, I consider not to be acceptable are quiz two, right? PP underscore one underscore nine. Right, I want you to use a class name that has some type of meaning. Uh, but I tell that to you up here. So the name of your class should describe what the program actually does or have meaning to what the program actually does. Okay. All right, and there's more here. We'll probably get into a lot of this stuff in chapter two. Some identifiers in the program Excuse me, some, I, excuse me, sometimes the programmer chooses the identifier, such as Lincoln. Sometimes we are using another programmer's code, so we use identifiers that he or she chooses, such as printline. Oh yeah, printline is also an identifier, right? So that's a method, and so is this, and so is that, right? Those are all identifiers that somebody else created. Often we use special identifiers called reserve words that already have a predefined meaning in the language, a reserve word cannot be used in any other way. And here is a list of all the Java reserve words. Okay, so your very first test, you have to know every single one of these. You have to m just memorize this entire list. I'm just joking, um, <laughs> but you should be familiar with the ones that we use every day, right? So public, static, void, boolean, int, like all the different types that we're going to use. We're actually, we won't even cover like half of these by the time we end this class, right? But we should cover at least uh, a good majority of half. All right, so quick check. So which of the following are Java, 
valid Java identifiers. Let's go back to the rule, right? So the rule for valid Java identifiers, you have to know this for your exam, is an identifier is made up of letters, digits, underscore, and the dollar sign. It cannot begin with it with a number, right? It can't be begin with a digit, and it cannot be a reserved word. Okay, so numbers, letters, um, the underscore, and the uh, dollar sign, and it cannot be a reserved word. So hopping back over here, so is grade a valid identifier? Yeah. How about quiz grade? Yeah. Network connection. Yeah. Frame yeah. two. Yes. yes, it is. Okay, how about third test score? No. Right, because it begins with a, a digit. Maximum? Yes. Uh, min capacity? Yes. What student and then the pound symbol? No, right, because the only symbol is that we can have is the underscore and the dollar sign. And then there's shells one and two. No, right? Like a, a other valid one that confuses some students is I can do something like that, right? That's a valid job identifier. The rule doesn't say that we can't start with a dollar sign or an underscore, right? That's perfectly allowed, right? Um, it just, you could just count that with a number, okay? And then here are all the results from that check. <coughs> white space, so spaces, blank lines, and tabs are called white space. White space is used to separate words and symbols in a program. Extra white space is ignored. A valid Java program can be formatted many ways. Programs should be formatted to enhance readability using consistent indention. So they want you to look at Java one or Lincoln but they don't give it to you. Heck, or did I delete that slide by accident? I don't know. All right, well, basically what they mean is we do have a coding standard of how you format your code, right? But white space is ignored. So right now this program compiles. If I were to compile it, I do control one. Wait, control one doesn't work. Hold on. Oh, I don't even have this set up to compile. The heck. All right, let me, where's this? My desktop, my Java programs. So I'm going to compile this program. All right, it compiles because it doesn't like complain at me. Um, like a comp compilation error would be something like if I forgot this semicolon, right? I hop back over here, I try to compile, and it tells me I uh, expected a semicolon, go to line 10 of your Java file, you know, hop over to here, I'll look for line 10, and it's like telling me that I'm missing this semicolon. Okay, so with the semicolon, it compiles, and I can run this program as well. Right, and there is my output. Okay, so what they're saying here is white space is completely ignored by the compiler. So if I wanted to format my code to look something like this, right, like the compiler is not going to care. Right now, the only reason I had my code the other way was that was our coding standard, and it makes it easier for the programmer to read. I can put this on the same line. Right, so I have a line right here line six, and then I have this other line over here, line 29, all right? And I have all this white space in between. It's all ignored. I saved, right? Control S to save. I hop over here, compile, it compiles, and it runs, okay? If I were to make a mistake, let's just say, dang, where, where do I want to make a mistake at? Let's just say I put, had all this on one line. Right, and then I made the mistake of the semicolon. Like forgetting to put a semicolon. I save it. Compile. And now telling me that I'm missing a semicolon. It's telling me it's on line six. It is giving me a little error right here, telling me like where it thinks I'm missing it, right? So the compiler is always gonna give you hints of why your program's not working, right? You should always just read it, see if you can try to figure it out. Um, this, but it is telling me line six, it's pointing to where it belongs, but I'm mean, gonna have everything on line six, right? And this is really difficult to read. 
the way that I had it before is how I expect you guys to write your code where you have your class header inside of your class header you have indented the, the methods and then inside of your method you have the programming statements indented one level right so the methods are indented one level from the class and then the programming statements are indented one level from the method right so it looks nice and neat everything's kind of indented in each other and I can tell where the class begins where the method begins and where the programming statements begin all right that is white space <clears throat> now we're going to talk about program development all right program development the mechanics of developing a program include several activities writing the program in a specific programming language such as java translating the program into a form that the computer can execute investigating and fixing the various types of errors that w can occur so that's pretty much like the cycle of programming right so you write the program right and then you try to compile it and when you compile we create that dot class file that dot class file is what's actually uh, ran or it's the actual program that's run by the JRE if it doesn't compile right or if you run it and there's errors we'll go to investigate the errors software tools can be used to help with the part of with all parts of this process so language levels there are four programming language levels machine language assembly language high level language and fourth generation language each type of the CPU has its own specific machine language the other levels were created to make it easier for a human for a human being to read and write programs right so they're saying that there's machine language and that's essentially like all the electrical signals going to each other um, assembly language which are just um, like every processor has their own assembly language it's basically just instructions on how to make a processor do different things and you have what we call the high level language which is like Java, C++, um, other programming languages like that. And then fourth generation language, I don't really know, but I'm assuming it's things like, uh, I don't know, like Unity, right? You can use Unity, you, you write stuff in Unity, and then it turns it into like Java or something else, right? So basically, it's basically keeping you from writing high level language. It's writing high level language for you, so it's like an additional layer on top of that. Yeah. All right. So programming languages. Each type of CPU executes one only. Excuse me. Each type of CPU executes only a particular machine language. A program must be translated into machine language before it can be executed. <coughs> excuse me. A compiler is a software tool that translates a source code into a specific target language. Sometimes the target language is the machine language for a particular CPU. The Java approach is somewhat different. Okay. So what they're saying here is like the way C++ works where every computer has their own like machine language so you need a compiler for that operating system right so if i compile c plus plus on windows 64-bit uh, it's not going to work on mac os right or windows 32 okay so you need a compiler specifically for that um, computer right now java is somewhat different I'm going to go ahead and just draw it up really quick. I have this computer's touch screen and I have a pen. So let me see, whiteboard. It's going to look not that great, but hopefully it makes. What does it need to identify me? So I'm going to come over here and create a new. All right, so this is the way Java works. I don't know why this thing's red. Um, all right. Um, all right, so here is, let's see. What's the best way to explain this? Okay, so here is your source code, right? Your dot Java. Okay. Now, when we're ready to compile, it's Right? When we're ready to comp compile, we're going to use what we call the Java compiler. It comes with the Java development kit. It's the Java C. That's the command that we type, Java C, the name of the file. Okay. Now, if there's errors, right, it's going to shoot it back. Like, it's not going to compile. It's, right? And you're going to go back and make correct any mistakes. Okay. 
But if there isn't any errors, okay, then it's gonna you're gonna it's gonna generate what we call bytecode. This is specific for Java, by the way. This is the way Java works. Okay, it, it's gonna create a file called bytecode, and that is actually the dot class file that gets created, right? If you look in the directory of where you have your code, after you compile a program, let me just minimize this really quick. I have this Java programs. There's this dot class file, that's the bytecode, okay? Now the bytecode is what the GRE, the Java runtime environment, will read, right? When, it, when it, it's gonna run your program, right? So on your actual computer, you have this process that's running called the JRE, right? And it's going to read this bytecode, right? And then it's going to run the program, okay? Now, there's actually something going on like right here, right? Like to run this program, there's like a lot of stuff going on right there. Uh, you have your bytecode, the JRE is gonna run it. We get this to run by using the command, the Java command, I don't know if you guys remember that, but it's just Java and then the name of your, the class, right? Class. Right, and that's what I entered in when I ran my program here, right? This, that's me, wait, where's it? Oh. Hold on, let me clear this really quick. There's not so much on the screen. All right, so this is a command to compile, right? That's gonna generate the bytecode, but this is a command to have our JRE actually run the program. Or that it's just Java and then the name of the class and then the program gets ran. Now what's actually happening is you have your computer, right? So let me just do another one. Okay, so what's, what's going on here is here is your computer. Computer. Right, and it has its own operating system. Okay. Now there's actually a program on here that's running, right? The name of this program is your Java runtime environment, okay? Now it's reading in this bytecode, right? So here is the bytecode, okay? It's reading it in and it's translating it for you, right? So that it can talk to your operating system, okay? The operating system is specific for your computer, okay? Now, this is what makes, the JRE right here, is what makes Java, Java, right? So, the benefits of Java is you can write Java code and it runs the same everywhere, or most of the same everywhere, right? That's what they try to sell to you, but there's actually some developer who has to create that program, right? Developer, developer creates this, right? He has to create it for Windows, he has to create it for Linux, he has to create it for uh, Mac, right? There's actually no JRE that on um, any of the phones, right? So it's not existent on our phones, but it is existent on Windows computers, Mac OS, and Linux computers, right? So this is what kind of masks us from actually having to have a compiler for every specific computer, is like there's a middleman doing the work for us. Now some will argue that that makes Java slower than languages like C++, and it's true, right? Like if you go to any develop, like game developer company like PlayStation and all that, they use their own, they probably use C++, I'm pretty sure they do. They have their own library specific for the uh, CPU that they're targeting, right? So like they designed the PlayStation, they have a specific CPU, they have specific RAM, everybody has to develop for that specific machine. And the benefit of that is you can get things to run a lot quicker, right? But if you make a program that can run everywhere, right, there's the drawback, right? Especially if you're using something like Java, where it's a little slower because there's this middleman interpreting this code and then telling the operating system what to do, right? You don't, you have less control of the hardware component. Now it's good and it's bad, depending on what you're trying to do. Good in the sense that you can make something, it works everywhere. You don't have to worry about it, all the different operating systems. But if you have something that's gonna be like computer intensive, then you may want to consider a programming language that's going to target a specific computer. Any questions on that? I have yes. So, like, I downloaded the JDK application and this was supposed to have a JRE component in it. Yeah. But it didn't. So I tried to download, I guess, apparently the latest version of JDK doesn't have it, is what I learned. 
Uh, it actually, so it should be there. Particularly in the bin folder. Yeah. So if you look at wherever you installed your JRE, or excuse me, your JDK, like inside of this bin folder is like all the different programs that you can run, right? This Java one is your JRE right there. Like you can run that and it's gonna kick off and execute your bytecode. You should have that inside of your, um, your bin folder. Now if it's not working, then you probably don't have your environment variable set up correctly. Like a lot of times, uh, if you use a program that required Java, it installs Java for you, you have to go and remove that uh, path in there. Like if you look at your, oh, let me just show you guys real quick. So if you go to advanced, if you're using Windows, go to advanced system settings. Advanced. And then you go to environment variables, and then you look at your path. Oh, yeah, you had that video in there explaining that. So I followed that, and I did that. But you have to, you have, yeah, have to read that one there. if you look in here, and if you see something like, like there's Java right there for me, right? Yeah. But uh, sometimes, like, if an application that you downloaded and saw Java for you, it's going to say something like C, Oracle, Java Path, JRE, or something like that. You have to remove that. Because you want this to be your new Java. If you have your computer with you, I can help you uh, set it up. All right. All right. So that is a Jerry. That's basically what it does. It's a middleman. It's between your bytecode and your operating system. It just kind of interprets your bytecode and tells the computer what to do. All right. <coughs> We'll go ahead and read this now. Let me see what the book says. All right, so Java compiler translates Java source code into a special representation called bytecode. Java bytecode is not machine language for a traditional CPU. Bytecode is executed by the Java virtual machine. Therefore, Java bytecode is not tied to any particular machine. Java is considered to be architectural neutral, meaning like it can work on Mac, Linux, Windows, architecture neutral. And then here they give you a diagram of how this works. You have your source code, you compile it, you compile a bytecode, and then your Java virtual machine. Java virtual machine is part of your Java runtime environment, uh, runs your actual bytecode. Uh, developing environments, all right, so that was Java, right? Like that's how it, it works, all right? So development environments, there are many programs that support development of Java software, including the Java development kit, Eclipse, NetBeans, VJ, JGrass. Okay, the book is what recommended these. For us, we could just use Notepad++ or TextPad or Sublime. Uh, really, all you need is JDK, and you can type anywhere. Like even you could just use like what's the one that comes with Windows, like the regular Notepad, that this Notepad. You could just type in there and then compile here. Now. The benefit of getting an IDE built for Java is that it actually color codes everything for you, right? So it kind of makes it a little easier to read, right? Where if you were to type here, if I were to just copy and paste all this and save it as a Java file over here, come on, open up, right? It's just gonna look like that, right? So even if I name it .java, it's just gonna look like that. <coughs> Syntax and semantics. The syntax rules of a language is define how we can put together symbols, reserve words, identifiers to make a valid Java program. Semantics of a program, a program statement, define what the statement means, its supposed, its purpose or role in a program. A program that is synthetically correct is not necessarily semantically correct, meaning it's not doing what it was designed to do. A program will always do what we tell it to do and not what we meant it or meant to tell it what to do. All right, uh, that's syntax and semantics. Synt syntax is like the words and symbols that we put together to create a valid Java program, meaning it compiles. Or semantics is what we meant the st what we meant for the statement to do. Like if you meant for a program statements to convert Celsius to Fahrenheit, and when you run it, it 
doesn't do that correctly, then that means our semantics are, are wrong. So programming errors, there's three types of programming errors. There's compile time errors, runtime errors, and logical errors. Compile errors are when we try to compile and it doesn't compile, right? Meaning we violated the syntax of Java, right? That's where it tells you the line number, it gives you points things out. So a compile error is like when I left off that semicolon. Now you can really make some funky looking compile errors. Like if you totally confuse Java by like, just say deleted the opening of that class and we'll just say we got rid of this identifier, right? That's what I had for my program. I save it, I come over here, and I try to compile, and then it gives us that. Let me see, line six, error class interface. Okay, so it's actually kind of, I thought it would be a lot worse than this, but it's actually telling you that you need something, either a class, an interface, or a num. Now, I know that's kind of difficult for us because we don't know anything about an interface or enumerations, but we do know about the class. And then the next one says, Line eight, right, it's pointing to void, right? Like it's totally confused. It doesn't, it doesn't know that it's missing an open curly brace for the class header, right? So it's pointing here, telling us that um, it, we need a class interface or enumeration. All right, so you kind of have to be careful with what you're doing because you can do something to where <clears throat> even the compiler is just like, I don't know what you're trying to do. I can't help you. All right, so. That is a, a compiler violation of syntax. We have what we call a runtime error. The runtime errors are defined where a program actually runs, but something happens to where it crashes, okay? Meaning the, the program actually stops, okay? Now, uh, this can be, I don't know if this is true anymore, division by zero. I think in some cases it's handled, meaning it's just gonna just say like not a number or something like that. Uh, I would have to test it out. But something can happen to where your program crashes and the program just ends unexpectedly. That is what we call a runtime error. So the program compiles, we run it, it seems like it's working, but we get to a point to where it just stops abruptly, right? Like maybe bad user input, maybe it did something, it was trying to do something, but it did it wrong and it just would terminate, okay? That normally happens when we don't handle an exception we're not gonna learn about exceptions in Java 1 and Java 2, we'll talk more about it, but that's normally the cause of it. The last type of programming error is what we call a logical error. These are the most difficult ones. These are the errors that millions and millions of dollars get spent on correcting, and it's just basically an error in logic. So an error in logic could be something like trying to convert Celsius to Fahrenheit, but just say you're converting Fahrenheit to Celsius, right? Or you're, you wrote a program that is going to take the sum of two numbers, but instead of taking the sum, you're taking the, uh, you're multiplying them or doing something like that, right? Something like really, really big would be like, maybe like in a bank application, you know, they went to deposit, you know, $100, but then like only like $99 got in. Like somewhere there's an error in the math and it didn't do what was expected to do. That is a logical error. Those are the ones that are the most difficult to find. Um, but normally with the good testing, you can find like big, I mean like common logical errors, right? So when you write a program, it's always good to actually run it and then give it some data to make sure it does what it's expected to do. Here is the basic program development, right? I mean, it makes sense. You edit, save a program, you compile it. If there's errors, you go back and edit, save. If you compile it, it works. You execute the program, evaluate the results. If you find errors, then you go back to edit editing and saving the program, right? Pretty simple, makes sense, right? There's three steps. There's the writing the program, compiling it, and then actually running it. You gotta test at all those phases. And that is it for that section. This next section, object-oriented programming, this is what this whole course is about. It's a really important topic. I'm not gonna test you on it on our very first test. Wait, actually, is that true? Oh no, I take that back. We're doing a midterm. I switched from giving out tests to just doing one midterm. So I will test you on this when we get to chapter four, but it's kind of, it might be like over your head until we actually get to chapter four. I'm gonna talk about it anyway. All right. <clears throat> so 
So the purpose of writing a program is to solve a problem. Solving a problem consists of multiple activities, understanding the problem, design a solution, consider alternatives, you find a solution, implement the solution, test the solution. These activities are purely linear, they overlap and interact. The key to designing a solution is breaking, into, breaking it down into manageable pieces. When writing software, we design separate pieces that are responsible for certain parts of a solution. An object-oriented approach lends itself to this type of solution de decomposition. We will dissect our solutions into pieces called objects and classes. Java is an object-oriented programming language. The term implies an object is a fundamental entity of a Java program. Objects can be used effectively to represent real-world entities. For instance, an object might represent a particular employee in a company. Each employee object handles the processing and data, manage, data management related to that employee. An object has state, which is descriptive characteristics and behavior is what it can actually do. The state of a bank account includes its account number and the current balance. The behavior of a bank account includes the ability to make a deposit or make withdrawals. Note the behavior of an object changes the state. A class. A job, or excuse me, an object is defined as a class, or defined by a class. A class is a blueprint of an object. A class uses methods to define the behaviors of an object. The class that contains the main method of a Java program represents the entire program. The class represents a concept and excuse me, a class represents a concept and an object represents an embodiment of that concept. Multiple objects can be created from the same class. Okay, so what they're talking about here is like right now we're writing classes that just have the main method, right? We're gonna do that until chapter four. Right? So these types of classes are just the program. Right, nothing else. But we're going to start managing our classes so that we can keep data in, uh, into what we call objects. So, for instance, to say if I wanted to have a class for a student, right, a student will have a name, you'll have um, maybe some test grades, right? So, I'm going to move all the information of a student to a separate class, not named my first Java program but I'll name it student. And in there, I'm gonna have variables to retain the student's name and the student's test grades. And whenever I need a student object inside of my program, my first hour program here, I will instantiate an instance of that object. Meaning, oh, I need, a, I need to make a student object for uh, one of the students in the class, right? So I make that object, he has his own test grades, he has his own name, and then another student comes in, oh, I need to make another object for this student. That student will have his own test grades, have his own name, all right? So the class defines what the object is, but the object is actually the data of that class that you created for a specific uh, student, okay? It makes more sense whenever we just start coding it. I know they introduced it early. I'm not sure why, but uh, it's good to start thinking about this now, okay? Uh, here. The saying class is a blueprint. One blueprint can create several similar but different houses. So here's a blueprint and this house looks like this, that, that, right? Basically what they're saying is uh, a class is a blueprint for an object. In this case, this blueprint is for these houses. And you can make different houses from that one blueprint. Objects and classes. All right, so here they're saying a class is the concept of bank account. Okay, now we have multiple instances of this bank account. You have a bank account for John, you have a bank account for Bill, and you have a bank account for Mary, right? Here, these arrows here, they're just saying you have multiple instances for the same class. So here we defined, here's a blueprint for what a bank account does. There's not, nothing actually in here yet, right? It just tells us that that's the concept for it. But with that one concept, we can actually create objects that we put into memory for John and his balance, Bill and his balance, and Mary and her balance. Inheritance, okay, this is something that we're not talking about. Um, and not until Java 2. Um, so inheritance, I'm gonna go ahead and read this slide anyway. Inheritance, one class can be used to derive another via inheritance. Classes can be organized in hierarchies. So you can have an account, and then you can have a charge account, bank account, and then bank account, but you savings or checking account, right? They all, they'll all inherit from each other, 
they're all classes but like one is a little more specific so yeah well yeah you could just ignore that for now until java 2 and that is it that's it for chapter one pretty short um yeah anybody have any questions on this okay so next time we meet i'm going to talk about chapter two but we still have plenty of time so before we go i'm going to give you a quiz okay uh, i'm not sure if you guys have your computer set up but like i said we're going to program every single day right so if you don't have your computer set up you have to use one of the computers in the classroom <laughs> Okay, so here it is. So I want you to write a program that prints a tree to the screen using two different characters. Characters and must be, must be at least 10 lines tall. All right, so here's an example output. Let me just switch this over to pre-formatted. So let's just say I wanted to use stars for the top of the tree. Shoot, make it, why is this not working? Dang it, I'm hitting tab, that's what it is. All right, so right like there's a top of the tree nice and tree like yes meaning or 10 lines tall yes it 10 lines tall so that's one two three four five i don't like the way this looks right now Okay, and it's actually one of your homework problems as well, I think. All right, so that's already five. And then for the rest, I could probably just use the, what they call the pipe character. I don't know what you guys call it, but that's what I call it. Yeah, that. I'm just gonna copy and paste this. Dang it, that didn't work out as I thought it would. But you guys see the point, right? That's what I want you to do. Show it to me before you leave, I'll give you credit. If you don't show it to me before you leave, I'll give you a zero. All right, it's really simple. We have plenty of time. So go ahead and do that. You don't have to do that specific one. You can be creative. I know some people like to do the Christmas tree one where it's a triangle up top and then a small little stump at the bottom. The only things that you're gonna, like you can, when you write your program, right? The only thing you're gonna do is just use this system out print line multiple times. That's all you're really doing, right? Like if, so just as an example, I print out my first Java program once. If I put this 10 times, I'm gonna print it out 10 times, right? I'll come over here, compile, run. So you can see like, if you just arrange those characters a certain way, you can actually make a shape that prints out to the console. All right. So if you're completely lost, I'm sorry. I'm going to keep moving fast. Next class is going to be even worse. We're going to have to do like multiplication, division, all that stuff. So if you're not programming at home, you better start programming at home. If, you, if you're stuck, stuck, raise your hand. I'll try to get you situated to the point to where you can start creating this.